Okay, let's uh, let me see whether we have got some results. Oh, no one has uh, actually put in the menti yet. Let me just take a look very quickly. So there you are, Gerard. Your audience are from Petaling Jaya, Puchong, Dalak. Okay. Not sure where they are. Uh, is that? I think it's Kota Kina, uh, in Sabah. We even oh. got Singapore. Okay. Singapore, Malaysia, San Ignatius Church. Mm. Uh, Rosiet. I'm not sure where is that. Uh, Parish of uh, OLL. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> so Gerard, while the results are coming in, uh, okay. coming in, perhaps I do a quick introduction and then uh, I'll hand over the session to you. Is that all right? Yes. Now, can you get rid of that because I need to have something else on my own personal screen here? Yeah. yeah. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, but before that, can I invite uh, perhaps Father Peter Anthony to give us the say the opening prayer for us? Is that all right, Father? Yes, yes, can. Let us put ourselves in the presence of God and give thanks for the gift of Gerard, who are expert in this area, to be with us this morning. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the bountiful blessing from yourself. For each and every one of us with the gift of talents, with the gift of education, with the gift of all life that you are blessing upon us, especially the family life, Lord, which is very challenging in today's world as a lot of couples, a lot of parents are struggling to handle, to go through these challenges. And here this morning, Lord, with your blessing, we want to know how to live a family life with some guidance you wanted to teach us, you wanted to guide us with the expert of children who is here to present to us. Bless him and bless all of us who have participated in this program, especially the parents of God. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank, so thank you, Father. And uh, so some quick ground rules. Uh, please put your microphone on mute if you're not speaking. Uh, also, feel free to use the chat box if you have got any questions. Uh, you can also put it in the chat box while Gerard is speaking. And of course, at the end of the session, if you have got any questions at all, Gerard will, we will invite you uh, to unmute yourself and ask any questions, Gerard. So without much folly, I would like to uh, invite Gerard. Uh, perhaps you can do a quick introduction of yourself as well. Uh, and then to continue with this uh, topic that we are all so eager to listen to. Thank you, Gerard. All right, thank you, Deva. Uh, well, uh, introduction to myself. Uh, well, basically I'm a family therapist specializing in addictions counseling. And I'm located at Melbourne. I have moved to Melbourne for about 22 years now. And but I'd say that my special passion is integrating spirituality with psychotherapy and counseling. Uh, now, uh, last year, in, it's good to be back in Tana Aie, even though it's through Zoom, uh, and share with you some thoughts about family life. Huh? Now, when I left Malaysia 21 years ago, I, I didn't think I would continue playing a significant role in the life of the church in Malaysia. Strange, but COVID, the COVID pandemic has actually been quite instrumental in allowing this to happen, especially through the medium of Zoom. Last year, I was invited by Archbishop Julian uh, to, uh, what do you call that, to share a variety of psycho-spiritual topics. And I did eight sessions with the Kuala Lumpur Archdiocese and Ministry of Mental Health, uh, Mental Health. Uh, headed by Father Philip Chua. So it was at the last session I gave on the flourishing life that I connected with Deva. And uh, from that Zoom meeting, he you know, eventually 
led to this invitation to also share with the Kuala Lumpur Archdiocesan Ministry of Family Life. So here I am today, delighted to share with you what I can uh, about family life and how to help families to flourish and increase the odds for wholesome and happy outcomes. And that's really all we can do, isn't it? Increase the odds. There are no guarantees to anything. But if we can have the knowledge, the wisdom, and the dispositions, uh, there is a strong chance that we can greatly increase the chances of having the outcomes that we so desire in family life. Now, life continues being unpredictable with the COVID virus. And just when we thought Delta was over, Omicron raises the bar even higher. Believe it or not, last Friday on my birthday, I actually caught Omicron. <laughs> Good thing I'm not here in front of you. You all might catch it from me too. And uh, by Sunday, I was wondering whether I'd be fit enough to give this session today. But thank God, I'm, uh, I think I'm, I'm not yet 100%, but I'd say about 90%. And if I do cough a little bit more than usual, please understand it's, it's Omicron, okay? <laughs> So let's get back to the topic, what a healthy family system looks like. Now, you might be wondering why this topic? One of the reasons why I developed this topic was because in my humble opinion as a family therapist, working for more than 21 years with families and individuals, I have come to see that many people have no idea what a healthy family system looks like. They think that oh, if there's food in the table, children go to school, or, you know, well, we go to church on Sunday. Well, that's about it. Hopefully everything will work out well. Okay. Uh, many people think, oh, well, family life just happens and hopefully we'll be able to wing it. We have so many people who say, well, you know, when I had children, there's no manual provided about how to become good parents. And we just did the best we could, hoping that it was good enough. Actually, that's not true. Uh, there may not be any manual that your parents gave you. But today on the internet, there are, there's a tremendous amount of literature about parenting, about marital life, that if you take the trouble to search up, you can get a lot of wisdom and a lot of good ideas that can increase the chances of you having good family life. It might have been true for our grandparents that they you know, never had the books or the research material to increase their, their, their ideas about what a good family system is and how to go about doing it. But today, for you and me, it's all there in the air. And all you need is Google Wi-Fi and a computer or a smartphone, and you can get a lot of information, believe it or not. So for many people, there is rarely much thoughtful planning going into understanding what a family, healthy family life looks like and what we can do to increase the chances of achieving success. Often we go by our own experience from our own family of origin, which may or may not always be wholesome, you know. Uh, I, I can't, you know, tell you the number of people who I've counseled who thought they came from a normal family life and there were quite a lot of dysfunctional aspects in that family, you know, over-controlling mother, parents not talking, you know, alcoholism and all that sort of stuff. And sometimes when you're used to living in that sort of thing, you think that that's normal. But that doesn't really make it healthy. Okay. Well, the other thing also, the world has changed so drastically over the 60 years that methods of parenting that seem, or understandings of intimacy that may seem all right at a certain period of human history, 60 years ago, may today not be all right anymore, or not be or maybe counterproductive to good family life. Uh, take, for instance, the idea, spare the rod and spoil the child. You know, I've known too many families where this 
is used to the extreme. And as a result, there's a lot of trauma, there's a lot of scarring, there's a lot of unjust beating of their children, uh, which is why in countries like the West, you know, that is banned. But well, if you ban that form of punishment and you don't replace it with something meaningful, then that's also a problem. But clearly we need to find new ways to inspire discipline and, and you know, self-growth in our children. And, and that's why the task of parenting today is such a, uh, you know, something that requires a lot of research. And when, when, when parents don't spend time with that research, then you find yourself woefully inadequate. Now, you have probably heard of the maxim, if you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. Now I can assure you that family life is no different. If you fail to think carefully about what healthy family, have family life is and how you're going to achieve it, the chances are you're gonna make a lot of mistakes in the process. And what you get in the end may be far worse than what you had hoped for. As I said, thank God there are many studies over the last 30 years done on family life, research and books written. You know, the internet, as I said, full of good ideas. And I certainly want to urge you to explore them exhaustively to enrich your mind with ideas on things like how to deepen intimacy after 20 years of marriage or how to inspire your children rather than control or dominate them and similar topics. But not everything in the internet is good, but trust your judgment, your values, and your intuition. And I guarantee you, you can find jewels of wisdom that could make a huge difference in your family life. I'm hearing some uh, sound that's in the background. Can you all hear it? It's a lot of static. Okay. Can you please put yourself on mute if you're not speaking? Thank you. So, so get into the habit of doing exploratory research to enrich and expand your mind on how to bring about the best outcomes for your family as well as for your marriage. So let's start by breaking up this topic. What, a ha what does a ha healthy family system look like? The first thing I'd like to address is what is a family system? And what are modern family systems like? And secondly, I'd like to look at what a healthy family system looks like, in particular, the subsystems within the family. Now, 60 minutes is woefully inadequate to do justice to this very comprehensive topic, but I'll try to do my best. Now, so what is a family system? In classical sociological terms, uh, a system refers to a grouping or a unit comprising of individuals who interact with one another in a particular manner. Now, a family system is family, fairly similar. Within that system, there are subsystems. And it is important to understand these subsystems, all of which need to be managed and nurtured properly if the goals of the larger family are to be achieved. Before I get to understanding family subsystems, I want to emphasize one thing. That in the world today, you know, in particular in the West, but I think also more and more in a country like Malaysia, there is no longer one unanimous description of what a typical family system looks like. You know, there's no more kind of one size that describes it all. Now, a number of us from a Catholic family background might see traditionally the family in terms of the traditional nuclear family, for instance. So, you know, this is the father and the mother, the husband goes out to work, the wife is the uh, you know, housewife, and she does most of the domestic chores and all the child rearing. They're clearly segregated roles. The husband doesn't do much of that. He just goes and works and comes back, you know, and the, the wife does all that work, that kind of thing, okay? 
this model is actually fast diminishing, believe it or not. Another model is what we call the symmetrical model. Now, as women become increasingly educated and work is available for them, they are doing as much. It's not untypical to find a family where the father and the mother go out to work, okay? Now that's a bit of a different system from the earlier one. So who takes care of the children? Well, maybe maids, uh, maybe extended family, or you send your children to childcare, okay, if you are wealthier. Okay. So this is a different kind of family system from the traditional one. And then you've got also, you know, we have the nuclear family, but the man is the house husband. You know, especially when women today are more and more educated and they have better jobs sometimes, and especially if they are you know, a bit disillusioned with men who are overly competitive or overly macho, you know. Uh, they might prefer a man who, 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 who is prepared to stay at home and take care of the kids. Now, this is also a new uh, model that is emerging. Not really a big model yet, but it is there. Uh, more typical you now find these days is the extended family system. Now, unlike in the past where you have the uncle and auntie and all that staying in the same house, today it's the father and the mother and the children. And then you might have maybe an auntie or a spinster cousin or a grandparent staying there, taking care of the children. Now, this extended family member now becomes an integral part of the family. Uh, this can be both a blessing, but that can also be a problem. You know, especially so if the grandparents or the aunties have a different style of parenting from the parents. Now in the West here, you have what we call matrifocal lone parent family or single parent family. In this case, the mother matrifocal. Huh? Uh, this is becoming increasingly common. In fact, this is one of the uh, big minority now, single mother families. Uh, then you also have patrifocal, a single father families, uh, where the father and the children live together, okay? Uh, it's less. Uh, you have also reconstituted families, you know, because of divorce or things that happen, families split and then two people marry and they bring three of their children from one and three from the other, like the Brady Bunch. Uh, now, uh, this is becoming increasingly common in the West. I'm not sure how it is in, in Asia, in Malaysia, uh, but certainly a lot more common than what it used to be a hundred years ago. Here in the West, you have same-sex couples, you know, uh, homosexuals uh, who, who, you know, kind of like want to have children. In the West, you are allowed to, I'm, I'm sure in Malaysia, you're not. Uh, but this is another kind of family. In Malaysia, I think that there's another kind called living apart family, okay? And, and you might have father, mother, and children, but the father goes to Brunei to work or, or Singapore to work, especially if you stay in Johor and might come back, you know, once or twice a month, you know? Uh, and, and the job that takes them at least 50% of the time, you know, away from the home. So it's a very different family configuration. So it's more or less like a, like a single mother family, although they are not divorced, they're still together. But by necessity, because of financial problems, one has to go out of the state to go and work and can maybe come back only once a month or once or twice a year. Now, this in the Philippines is not at all uncommon. There are a lot of Filipino women who, even though they are married and have children, actually move to say Malaysia, Singapore, Norway, Europe to work as domestic help. And they send their money back to support the husband and the children. <coughs> now that in itself is a different kind of a family system. So it's kind of living apart. Huh? So I just want to emphasize that, you know, there's no unanimous definition anymore. And, and it's a constant mishmash and evolution of family life. I'm not saying that 
all of it is equally good. I, I hold the Catholic model that I think the best model is still the, you know, the, uh, the traditional model or at least the asymmetrical model. Now there's somebody who's, uh, I think maybe Jenny or what, your, 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 I can hear background stuff. Uh. So let's get back to family subsystems. As I said, the family system is constituted of various subsystems. So let's identify these subsystems. At the first level, you have what we call the spousal or marital subsystem. This is the relationship between the husband and the wife. Now, this has a dynamic of its own and is in many ways the most important subsystem within the family. If there are problems in this subsystem, eventually the whole family system will be affected. So this is one subsystem that needs special attention to be taken care of, okay? Another subsystem is the parenting subsystem or the parent-child, parent-children subsystem. And this would refer to the duties and responsibilities that we as parents have with our children and how we manage them to the best of our ability. Then there's a third subsystem and that's the sibling subsystem. How children interact with one another. There's a certain life of its own too. And, and it's important for parents to be able to guide that healthy subsystem because you know, if not means, you know, sometimes the sibling rivalries can get out of proportion. You know, we've heard of stories how later on in life, you know, you got brothers and sisters who don't talk to one another at all. And, uh, you know, who hate one another, can't stand aside of one another. Uh, and, and that probably might be because that family subsystem, the sibling subsystem, has not really been nurtured properly or allowed to develop properly. And then in quite a number of Asian families, you've got the grandparents, aunties, uncles, which is the extended family subsystem, who are also an integral part of the family dynamics. So it's good to think of life, of family life in terms of these four subsystems, but in particular, the marital subsystem, the parenting subsystem, and the sibling subsystem. Now, once we understand this, we realize that for each of these subsystems to thrive and succeed, you actually need to give time and energy to them. In fact, the whole family system thrives when we are able to give our energy, time, and involvement in a balanced manner to each of these subsystems to increase the chances that they all become successful. Now, a lack of understanding of subsystems often leads to some of these subsystems being unintentionally, usually it's unintentionally, neglected and diminished, which then can affect the entire family system in quite a negative way. For example, in many Asian families, the all too common mistake is that too much time is given to the parenting or parent-child subsystem and not enough time to the spousal marital subsystem. It's all about the children. It's all about the children, okay? Now think about it. Huh? For any subsystem to flourish, we need to give it time and energy. If this is not given, that subsystem could die or it could fizzle away. The spousal subsystem is not different. If you don't pay attention to it, it can diminish and even die out. You know, intimacy can erode. And over time, when things don't get resolved and the connection, the communication is not there because the time spent is not there, the couple can feel less and less love and affection for one another simply because they have unintentionally neglected one another by over-focusing on children or work too much. So good to ask ourselves the question, how much time do we spend nurturing our spousal subsystem? Do we 
still go out for dinner dates or walks, just the two of us, at least once a month? Do we find time to listen and care for each other? Every day over a cup of tea or maybe just before sleeping, we spend some quality time sharing and talking about things? Or is life so rushed with other priorities that we have, again, unintentionally been neglecting one another? Things unresolved are just swept under the carpet, hoping that they'll go away, which often it doesn't. Love, affection, and intimacy gradually become replaced by frustration, resentment, and anger. And over time, the couple can, tend, can then become very disconnected from one another. Things might be able to plod along until the emptiness. When the child, when the children leave, and then we suddenly wonder why we can't stand one another anymore. Because we haven't spent time nurturing our spousal relationship. Now, remember this one very, very important fact that I'm going to give you, okay? Your children will be actively in your life for the most around 20 to 25 years. Your husband or your wife will be around in your life for about 50 years. Well, that's if you live until 80, which is not uncommon. Now, remember, this is unprecedented in human history, you know. Right until about 150 years ago, the average lifespan of people was around 35 to 45. Did you know that? It's only now that we are living with increased medical advances around 75, 80, even 90 is not uncommon. But about 150 years, people lived 45. That was already a long life. So if you got married 25 at the, age, at the age of 25, you are likely to remain married for about 55 years. Compared to 150 years, if you married at the age of 20 and you died around 35, you'll be married for about 15 years. Think about it, 15 years of marriage compared to 55 years of marriage. Now it's not easy to live with another human being for 15 years, even if there is love. 55 years is quite a big challenge, which is why a lot of marriages today don't work out. Now in Australia alone, uh, you know, one statistic showed that about 35% of marriages end up with a divorce or separation. That is 3.5 out of, 100, out of uh, 10 marriages. In America, it's even higher. I, I, I read a statistic in 2019 saying that in America, about 45 to 52 percent, this was in 2020, 2020, marriages end up in a divorce or separation. Now, I'm not exactly sure what the divorce rates in Malaysia are, but I believe they are also on the increase. And so if you neglect your spousal relationship, there can be huge consequences. Now, statistics show that, believe it or not, the two most common ages where divorce happens are within the first five years of life, and the second is between the ages of 50 and 65. You say, what? You know, after 20 or 30 years of marriage, we are still high risk? Well, that's what the statistics show, especially during the empty nest period when the children have left home and you and your husband are left or wife facing one another. So if you have not invested in the relationship over the years, chances are it's not going to go well when the emptiness happens. Now, let's look at the parenting subsystem. I'll return a little bit more to say a bit more about the spousal subsystem, but I want to go through now the parenting subsystem. Now, there's a program that I used to offer uh, many years ago called Soulful Parenting. I like to think about parenting using what I call the rose bush model. Now, if any of you here have grown rose bushes, 
you will know that there are three very important tasks to be done. Number one, safety. You got to keep your rose bush safe from insects, from disease, from animals, too hot or too cold temperatures. Secondly, you need to nurture your rose bush, dig around it, fertilize it, water it daily. Uh, some people say that you should even talk to your rose bush or sing to your rose bush. You know, in fact, there's quite a lot of good research that says that if you sing to your rose bush, it actually flowers better. You might want to try that, eh? And finally, you need to prune it. So safety, nurturing, and pruning. Now, if any of these tasks are not done properly, then the chances of your rose bush growing well is going to be compromised. If all three are not done, chances are your rose bush will end up a disaster. Now, I use this model to, to, to illustrate the three central. You might to say the back, but it's not the. Hi, right, Brendan. I think you're, you're, uh, can you put your, your mic on mute, Brendan? Okay. Um, now, as I said, I, I use this model to compare the three major tasks of parenting. The first task is that the home must be emotionally, psychologically, and, and physically safe secure and stable. We know from psychological research that when a home is safe, children feel secure. They are more curious, more adventurous, more confident about life. They're more optimistic, more, and they trust more easily that good things can happen. However, if the home is emotionally and physically unsafe, children grow up feeling insecure feeling anxious, more prone to developing mental illness or addictions later on in life. The second task of parenting is nurturing self-esteem. This is the same as nurturing in the rose bush. Huh? Now, this involves praising your children, affirming them, listening to them, taking time to understand them, showing empathy, making them feel valued and important. You know, when you take time for your children, that's a sign of love, isn't it? Uh, you know, children especially feel love most tangibly when the parent is there with them. And so when you're not there, even though you provide money for all their needs, they don't feel that love as concretely as if you are there physically with them. So part of nurturing self-esteem includes hugging, showing appropriate physical affection, when this happens, children feel confident. They start believing in their abilities. They face the world feeling that they can succeed and face challenges successfully. When this nurturing doesn't happen, there's a lot of self-doubt. There's a lot of distorted, poor self-esteem. A lot of anxiety about their abilities and their capacity to succeed in life. And then finally, the third aspect of the rose bush model pruning, which in the family system is what I call character development. Now, a lot of people think that character development is just spare the rod and spoil the child. It's just about disciplining. It's much, much more than disciplining. It does include self-discipline, cultivating self-discipline, uh, which is you know, having the capacity to achieve my goals by managing my emotions. Okay. Uh, but it definitely also includes cultivating emotional intelligence, spiritual intelligence, moral and ethical intelligence, teaching your children how to pursue wisdom, helping them to find a higher purpose in life, teaching them leadership skills, how to think and seek truth, critical thinking teaching them things like prayer, meditation, and self-reflection, mindfulness. Now, this is probably the hardest of the three tasks. And many parents often don't know where to start. If any of these three tasks are not done well, my friends, the chances are your child is going to grow up 
with personality problems, anxiety, fears, a lack of hope, lack of confidence, character weaknesses, addictive tendencies, and so forth. If all three are not done, disaster is likely to happen. Delinquency later on in life, alcoholism, antisocial personality, behavioral patterns, substance addiction, problems with the law, educational failure, toxic and dysfunctional relationships. Uh, Maria, can you put your thing on mute, please? Now, as I went through the three fundamental tasks of parenting, some of you might be wondering, oh dear, I don't feel at all competent in especially number two and number three, okay? How in the world am I going to be a successful parent? Well, the answer to that is we are all works in progress or a friend of mine said WIPS, W-I-P-S. We all works in progress. You know, there's a famous saying, if you want to grow up, get married. <laughs> okay. And if you want to grow up double fast, get children. They very quickly will make you aware of your own level of maturity or immaturity and challenge you to grow. Now, of course, if you rise to that challenge, you will reach your high potential, your highest potential. If you don't and neglect that, then you remain stunted. And you and I probably know a lot of people who remain stunted and immature. Their bodies have grown, their age has grown, but they themselves have not grown. They still maintain certain problematic characteristics that they had when they were teenagers. There's lack of self-awareness, there's self-centeredness, egocentricity, and all that. So helping our children to grow necessarily means that we take a look at our own lives. You know, so that we actually practice what we preach. I want to come back to the marital spouse system. Now, you know, I've touched a bit on this earlier, but I think it's important enough to deserve a second mention. How can you increase the odds that the marital or spouse system will be successful? My advice is continue consciously because you have to do it consciously it's not going to happen if you if you just say oh well when we have time we'll do it you know you have to make time for it huh? consciously work at cultivating deep connection intimacy intimacy is not something that you know once you achieve it it'll remain like that forever remember you can fall in love but you can also fall out of love Love is not eternal unless it's God's love, you know. When two people get married, you know, they have a lot of love. But if they don't nurture the emotional bank account that Stephen Covey talks about in his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, that bank account can diminish. Okay. Uh, so you might have a lot of love. And if you, you know, subsequently you know, don't respect one another, don't communicate well, take one another for granted, are overly critical of one another, not affirming uh, and all that. What happens is that emotional bank account gets less and less and less and less and less until it reaches a point where it cannot sustain a big challenge. But if every day, you know, you build up that bank account, you know, you send, oh, you get a chocolate for your wife or cook something special for your husband, you, you, you affirm them with words of praise, you, you, you understand the five languages of love that I think Gary Chapman, I think, wrote the book, Five Languages of Love, that should be probably quite popular with people in the marriage group, okay? Understanding your, your, your spouse's language of love and taking the trouble to show them love in that particular way, then what will happen is you find this emotional bank account becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. And even if there is a, a crisis, you know, uh, it is strong enough to weather that crisis. So be mindful about sensitivity, respect, 
politeness, some, something simple like politeness, showing compassion, generosity, mutually supporting one another, showing a lot of empathy. Now, women in particular, you know, want empathy. You know, men might be less needy of it, although I believe they too want it. They're just too proud to ask for it. <laughs> we like to be understood, okay? Uh, showing emotional support. Now, never, never, ever take love for granted. You know, it can grow or it can die. Don't for one moment think, oh, we've been married for 30 years already, so what's the big deal? I will probably go on. Remember I told you the second high, highest risk for divorce is between 50 to 65? And I suspect that that's all of you in this group, <laughs> except for the two priests here. Yeah? Uh, so never take love for granted. Now, this is some interesting psychological research about the types of love in marriage, okay? So, you know, one type of love, this was in the 80s, I think. They talked about passionate love versus what is called companionate love. Now, passionate love is characterized by lust, by sexual excitement, by romance, you know, uh, feelings of, wow, bliss, and so forth. And there's a place for that too. I don't want to say that that's not important. But your relationship cannot be based just on passionate love. Because passionate love can be very impermanent. In the early years of the marriage, you know, you're really so one, you're having sex about almost every day or whatever, you know. And then after the first child comes along, you know, you're lucky if you get it once a week. By the time the second or third child comes along, you're lucky if you get it once a month. You know, too tired, too many chores, too many responsibilities, you know. So if your love was based on just passion, when that passion diminishes because of circumstances of life, well, that will be the end of your marriage. There's another kind of love, and this is called companionate love. A companionate love is a decision to be committed to a relationship. Regardless of whether you feel passion or not. And even at times when you feel a disconnection, when you feel stress, you still remind yourself, I must be committed to this relationship. I am not going to take this relationship for granted. I will be there for her. I will be there for him through thick and thin. I will do the little things to, to try to make our relationship not just endurable, but pleasant. You know, so, so it is based on a decision to make the relationship work. And when that is companionate love, okay, you'll find that the chances of the relationship surviving are much, much higher. You know, you, you, um, you, you sometimes uh, look at Hollywood and you see you know, the old man at the age of 90 walking into the sunset with his wife, holding hands together still, you know? And that looks so wonderful. Oh, they're so lovey-dovey even at the age of 90. I assure you, that's a very rare thing. In the West, okay, out of every 100 marriages, Depends in Australia, 35 die. In America, 45 to 52 die. Another 20 would probably tolerate the marriage, tolerate the hardships, tolerate the nonsense in their marriage because they feel that, you know, I don't have many options. What's the point of living, leaving this relationship? So they are there, but they might as well not be there. They're miserable with one another, but oh, we better stick it out because if not means we have to have property settlement at the age of 65 to buy another house, too much trouble. And, and besides, you know, what guarantee is there that if I find somebody else, that too won't happen. So a lot of people live in a marriage, remain in the marriage, even though it's miserable. They never go for counseling. There's too much pride. 
too much hurt, but they stay together. And believe it or not, these kinds of marriage are actually the most damaging to children. And you got another about 20 who would try to make it work. It's not ideal. We compromise. We try our best. We learn to accept the frailty and the inadequacies and the idiosyncrasies of our partners. We try to make it work. We may not be 100% happy, but at least we are 50% all right. And that's also quite acceptable. A lot of marriages are also like that. And it's only about 5%, the most 10%, where they are really lovey-dovey till the end of their days, walking hand in hand into the sunset, as they say. The secret of that is, my friends, companionate love. Okay. Let me touch something on the sibling subsystem now. This is the system that your children exist in. That is also a subsystem. Most of the time they are playing together by themselves. They are by themselves when you're working or doing other things. It's important that you teach your children, for instance, how to forgive one another, to respect one another, communication, how to problem solve when they have problems. That you teach your children principles of justice and fair play, how to be sensitive to one another's needs and to look out for one another. How to manage conflict in a proactive and wholesome way. How to be assertive, not aggressive and dominating. Encourage them to love one another, to care for one another, to help one another to solve problems by themselves. Encourage them to move on from dependence to in independence, and finally back to interdependence. That's another uh, model of being that Stephen Covey talks about in his book, Seven Habits. And then get out of the way. Don't interfere too much. Allow them to solve their problems with one another rather than stepping in every time there is a problem. When they have interpersonal skills, leadership skills, and confidence in their abilities, they will work it out. Well, you can debrief with them afterwards. Okay, what happened and how did you solve this problem? But don't feel a need to step in too easily and try to solve things for them. No, they need the practice to learn how to solve problems on their own for one another. I want to end my talk, I know I've got only 10 minutes left, by inviting you to think of family life by thinking about three things. The family vision, family values, and family plan. And this is to help you to think in a more focused manner about what we believe about family life and how are we going to actually get there. So that this doesn't become just an intellectual exercise and that you can actually, you know, plan to increase the chances of having a better family life. Huh? So first of all, what is a family vision? Now, these days, even in, in the corporate world, you talk about the vision, okay? Vision, values, and mission or whatever, you know? So the family vision is a broad overview of what the family hopes to become. It's a short and sweet statement. Uh, nice on ideals, but not very good on detail. It's not meant to be on detail, okay? So good to get the family together, especially when your children are, are old enough, around 11, 10, 12. Let's talk about a family vision. So one vision could be something like that. We want to become a family where everyone thrives, lives out our human and spiritual potential to the fullest. Wow. Nice, isn't it? Or another vision could be, we want to be a family where individually and collectively 
we can lead the flourishing life or eudaimonic existence, growing both externally and internally. Well, if, uh, if you go and listen to my talk on the flourishing life, you'll understand what eudaimonic existence means. You know, it's a <coughs> kind of happiness <coughs> cultivating a strong inner life. Right? I don't have time to get into that. Or another most spiritual family vision could be, we want to make real the kingdom of God in our family, where our family life is regulated by the values of the gospel. Or another vision can be, we want our family to be and live the gospel invitation of Jesus, of living life to the fullest, to be fully human and fully alive. In the words of the famous Jesuit writer, John Powell, there's a book he wrote, Fully Human, Fully Alive. So these are some examples of vision statements. Best done by the whole family that, wow, this is something we can really aspire towards. But as I said, it's strong on uh, focus, but not strong on detail. The next thing is family values, therefore. To put in a bit more detail now, you come to family values. So this gives flesh to the vision. What exactly are the values that, that this whole vision is based on? or I put it in another way, what are the actual qualities that we wish for everyone in this family to have? So qualities could be, you know, in this family of ours, compassion is very important. We show compassion to one another. Honesty and integrity are very important. We want everyone to have a great desire to seek wisdom and knowledge. Creativeness is a divine attribute. So we want our family to be creative. Respect is quite central in our relationships. Not just between children and parents, but children and children, older and younger. Social justice is very important. Loyalty is very important. To care for the environment, as Pope Francis says in his encyclical Laudato Si. So that we have a personal and collective responsibility for the earth. In our family, we value personal development and growth. a desire to cultivate spirituality and forge a stronger relationship with God. So these are values that are priorities in our family vision. But again, how exactly are you going to execute these values? And this is where your family goals or plans come about, family plan, okay? So what do we need to do? to actualize these values. So for example, if social justice is important, what are we going to do to inspire our kids in social justice? You know, I know a friend of mine who, his mother, you know, she worked with the Winston DePaul. And so every time, you know, she would take her children to go and help distribute food parcels. That's one way to help your children become aware of the plight of the poor, okay? Uh, you know, uh, another family I knew in Malaysia, you know, when, when during school holidays, instead of going to Singapore or going to Portixon for holidays, they would go to an Orang Asli village in Bido or Tanarata and stay in uh, one of the kampong, one of the Orang Asli people and give them a bit of money so that they experience the life of the Orang Asli and see what their problems, their difficulties and their challenges were. And that also helped them to value the environment. Uh, or, you know, uh, in, you know, when my children were young, I used to take them, even in Federation Square, they used to have these Berse rallies, you know, Berse, Berse, you know, at that time when the uh, Reformasi movement. Eh? So taking your children to these kinds of things to help them to realize that, you know, we, we cannot tolerate corruption and, and injustices, inequalities, 
in politics and that we have to make a stand. You have to teach your children this. Or, you know, uh, one of the things I did when, I, when the children were young is I would encourage them to, you know, every year I'll give a certain amount to charity and I'll ask my children. I know they don't have much, but I'll say, okay, Philip, you know, or Andrea, how much would you like to give? So they might have about $100 in their savings. And some of them will say, oh, I'll give $30 there. Of course, I'll take it and then quietly put it back in their <laughs> bank account. But that gives them a sense of giving to the needy and the poor. So when you do these things, what happens is your children develop a sense of social justice. Another thing like to care for the environment. You know, I know a family that once a month, they, you know, the children, will, the whole family will go to a beach or a river bank and they'll take plastic bags and they'll just go around collecting plastic bags, Coca-Cola cans, you know, plastic rubbish and all that. And people will be wondering what are they doing, you know? And they say, oh, this is our way we, we, we show our care for the environment. You know, they teach them to save water even though they can afford it. They teach them to value things and recycle, reuse, and not waste things. Okay. So there are many ways you can actually have an environmental agenda for your family so that your children can become aware of it and not abuse the earth, as Pope Francis says in Laudato Si. Or if spirituality and prayer are important, well, how do you inspire your children to make this a priority? Quite apart from going to Sunday Mass or saying the Rose Family Rosary or you know, Bible sharing and Bible reflection in the family, you know, prayer before meals. Uh, but more importantly, teaching them how to meditate, teaching them how to practice mindfulness, teaching them how to journal and practice interiority. Now, these are things you can actually teach your children. If this is not done, don't expect your children to value spirituality as much as you wanted them to. It is in the doing that values become, you know, crystallized and integrated into a person's system. When there's no emphasis, when there's no time and energy put in, all this just becomes theoretical ideas. And as I often tell people, if you don't consciously and deliberately influence your children, there are a thousand other influences out there from the internet to their mobile phone, through their computers, through their iPads that will influence your children. And many of these influences are not healthy influences. If you don't consciously form their minds, others will form their minds and take them to a place you're not going to be happy with. Okay, so I know our time is up right now and I hope I've managed to cover, yeah, I think I've managed to cover what I wanted to cover. So with this, I, I will end, uh, you know, basically what I've talked about is what a healthy family system looks like and I've broken down it into you know, subsystems, marital system, spousal subsystem, the parenting subsystem, the sibling subsystem. And then finally, I talked about, you know, um, what a family vision is, family values, and a family plan in order to increase the chances that your family grows up in the image and likeness of what we would term a good Catholic family. So thank you very much, and God bless you. And maybe now we can open up for questioning. Thank you very much, uh, Gerard. Uh, that was a wonderful one hour session. I've taken quite a bit of notes and I'm sure uh, the lights of people here uh, around the uh, virtual room, some of us are presenters at programs like Retroval, CMPC, Marriage Encounter. Uh, there are a lot of nuggets that uh, I myself have taken so that we can make use of this, some of this in our own presentation in the future. So thank you very much for that. Um, so we'll open now for any questions um, that you might have throughout the one hour session and also anything else <laughs> you have, um, I'm sure Gerard would be able to uh, take them and give his perspective on those. 
So I uh, welcome all of you to either unmute yourself and ask questions, or you can put the questions in the chat box if you like. I used to belong to the marriage encounter many, many years ago when I was a religious brother in Penang, you know, under Edwin Johnson's time, I think, yep. Just for about two or three years, that's all, you know. I had an, I, I, I had another, my partner was Brother Andrew, <laughs> Andrew Area. I'm not sure what happened to him since, uh, but that was my little stint with uh, ME. It's quite good. <clears throat> Any questions? So, Gerard, maybe I'll get the ball rolling. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, so you mentioned about the um, four subsystem. And, you know, uh, to be honest, this is the first time I'm listening and I'm made aware, my wife and I are made aware of the subsystem that we have in the family. But besides these four, do you think there are other, perhaps not as important as these four, there are other subsystems, like, for example, me and my workplace, is that a subsystem that, I need to look up, uh, I need to watch out for that could have an impact on my family, me and yes. my friends, my children and their friends. So can you perhaps uh, enlighten us Enlighten us on that? Thank you. Well, because, thank you, Deva. Uh, because the focus has been on family, I have chosen to you know, look in particular at the family system. Uh, of course, a human being is impinged upon by many other influences, you might, be a, you might be a politician, certainly your work, your career, uh, certainly your life in church, for instance, involvement in other groups that are also a part of who you are. Uh, but in this, what we are talking about since is the family system. And I wanted to highlight just this. And I'm certainly quite aware that many of these other influences can become quite substantial in our lives to the point that it actually impinges upon the family system, you know. Uh, but I, I didn't, I chose not to address those because they're just too many. You, you, you know, my friends, for instance, you know, uh, some people, you know, every week they must go out with their friends or their beer drinking khaki or their fishing khaki or their golf khaki, you know. Uh, but uh, I suppose all of these are important, but uh, you know, it must be seen in the context of a healthy family life. Uh, oh. So I suppose balance is a very important thing to be able to, to, to be conscious of getting the balance right, you know, because we can very easily not get the balance right. And once the balance gets wrong, then you find that you're not spending enough time with this, you're not spending enough time with that. And, and, and next thing you know, you know, you find that all these subsystems start falling apart. It's as simple as that. If you neglect it, it just won't develop. And it's a very objective thing. You know, it doesn't matter whether you intentionally do that or whether you consciously don't do it. If you don't do it, it's not going to grow. And if it doesn't grow, then all the problems that accompany a lack of development in these subsystems will are likely to happen. Another, another thing that also is important is apart from, you know, is the individual. Because as individuals, we need to also have our own personal space, quite apart from our spouse, our children, or the larger family system. We need to have time every day, maybe 15 to 20 minutes, where we are by ourselves, you know, our little quiet time, our time with God, our time with prayer and so forth, to be able to think, to be able to process life, reflect over your experiences, uh, gain the wisdom that comes from the experiences you have lived. A lot of people, you know, I, I for one, you know, have come to realize that wisdom is not a function of how many experiences you have. Some people can have hundreds or thousands of experiences and live and learn nothing from them. <laughs> they keep repeating that mis same mistakes over and over again. I think wisdom is more a function of how much time you spend reflecting over these experiences and in the Catholic context, seeing what is the Holy Spirit teaching you from these experiences. And if you spend time doing that, you're going to actually grow a lot, lot more than just going to one experience after another without even reflecting. 
So that would be another important area apart from work, apart from friendships, apart from you know, all the other external activities from your family, your individual time alone. You know, alone with none but thee, my Lord, I journey on my way. What need I fear when thou art near, O King of night and day? That's part of the divine office of the Catholic Church. Um, yeah, so, so that's also another time, quite apart from the spousal time, the sibling time, the parenting time, the me time. And in fact, I'd say that this is actually quite special. Because when you don't have that me time, all the others... Stephen Covey calls this taking time to sharpen the X. You know, that's the, the seventh habit. No? A lot of people go through life with very blunt axes, trying to chop down trees and wondering why the tree never gets chopped down or why it takes such a long time to chop down the tree. And all they really need to do is take about 10 minutes every day, sharpening the X. And what? <coughs> <coughs> And once the axe is sharp, you find you can live your life a lot more efficiently. So this sharpening the axe is analogous to taking me time with God, with self-reflection, with journaling, in order to think, process what's happening and learn from the lessons of life. But I, I take your point, Deva, it's, a, it's very much a big juggling act. Okay. Uh, you know, somebody says that, you know, in life we are juggling five balls, okay? Uh, four of these balls are rubber balls, and one of these balls are made of glass, okay? Um, no, sorry, one ball is a rubber ball, and four of these balls are glass. And if you don't know how to juggle them, they start falling down and cracking. Okay, so these five are your health, your family life, your marriage, your friendships, and your work. Guess which one is the rubber ball? Your, your work. You're right, your work. Yeah. If you lose your job, you can always get another job. Your marriage breaks, falls down, and cracks because you didn't juggle it properly. It cracks, gone forever. Your children, you never spend time with them, falls down and cracks, but the rest of your life, you're going to pay for that, okay? Your health, if you don't pay attention to it, you know, you get a heart attack at the age of 50 or 60, your life is screwed. Your friendships also are important, you know? Uh, again, just like your, uh, your marriage, your, your friendships might even be longer. If you have deep friendships that are very soul uh, life-giving, it's important to spend time nurturing those friendships. Because if you neglect those friendships, then they too can die. And friendship sometimes will even survive your spouse if your wife dies or your husband dies. Your friends, if they have deep, soulful friends, can nurture you, you know, throughout life, okay? So of these five balls we are juggling, the only ball is the rubber ball. And what's that? Your work, believe it or not. I don't want to make little of it, but I don't want to make too much of it either. It's balance, balance. I hope that answers your question, Deva. Yeah, thank you, uh, Andrew. Uh, that was, uh, I mean, that you, you gave some uh, context to, to my question. So there are some questions in the chat box as well. Um, uh, Peter but, Anthony, did I see your hand up? Or? No, no, okay. Okay. I, yeah. Uh, Okay, I'll I'll try and read. Sorry, that I, I have not checked the check the, the chat box because you know when I'm busy talking, it's a bit hard oh, to. Okay, I can I can read them for you, Andrew. Uh, okay. This question from Donald Sung. He asks, "What are the challenges faced by families currently in Malaysia?" Um, so, if you can answer them, Robert and Sheila can answer them. They are the head of Family Life Commission in the Archdiocese. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> and he asks. What are the gay relationship and, sorry, gay relationship, how do we manage it? Perhaps you want to answer the second question first, uh, Gerard, on gay relationship. Uh, well, the challenges on family life in currently, I think the pandemic definitely is a, a big challenge, you know, as people, uh, you know, lose their work, um, as finances go down, the stock market collapses and things like that. 
you know, financial difficulties. These are challenges, okay? Uh, it's important to face these challenges properly and intelligently. Um, uh, I, I think that the challenge of uh, social media is also a big challenge, okay? Uh, a lot of people spend a lot of time on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, Snapchat, uh, you know, on face, on, on uh, WhatsApp and so forth. And, and in fact, more than you find that that is beginning to take a substantial amount of time to the individual. And of course, where does this time come from? You know, we are just limited human beings. You have 24 hours, eight hours sleeping, eight hours working. You got only eight hours left for family life and everything else, health, exercise, and all that. So if this remaining eight hours, you're spending four or five hours on social media, many of the other systems are going to be collapsed, are going to be neglected unintentionally. So I think one of the big challenges facing uh, family life is the advent of the internet. And you know, you would like to think that, oh, well, the internet, you can get a lot of knowledge and wisdom. And that is true, you can. But you know, one survey I wrote that about 70% of non-related work uh, that people spend time on the internet is on pornography and on gambling and on gaming. So probably only about 20% use the internet for expanding the mind, researching things, uh, looking at YouTubes or video clips that can help them in their self-development. More than 80, 70 to 80% use it for just fun and, and, and you know, excitation of the senses. So I, I think that that's certainly not to be minimized because that's a real big problem even here in the West. Uh, I've seen you know, in, in, the, in, 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 in Asia where a lot of children, from the time they are little children, the parents give them a smartphone or an iPad so that they'll stay out of trouble, not realizing that they are creating an addiction to dopamine through uh, over-reliance uh, you know, over on, on internet addiction, on, on internet stimulation. I would put that as one of the big, great challenges to modern family life. Because it's taking, a, for the simple reason, it's taking a huge chunk of the eight hours that we have left, whether you're a student or you're a worker. So if you're taking a huge chunk of that, then where's the time going to be for? Listening to one another, having a cup of tea, having family chats, going for family outings, walks. Uh, listening to your children and all that, it's, something's going to suffer somewhere. And it's not just you, your children also are addicted to it, so they are not going to be interested in spending 20 minutes talking to mom and dad because they prefer to go on Instagram and Snapchat with their, their, their friends. So learning to manage this, I'd say, you know, is going to be a huge challenge. Okay? Now, with regards gay relationships, I, I don't know how serious that problem is or how serious that uh, that issue is uh, because you know homosexuality is still considered illegal in Malaysian culture, but I know in the West it is uh, becoming increasingly common, unfortunately. And um, um, uh, of course, you know, if you take a Catholic position, then we, we have to say that you know it is not morally tenable for two people of the same sex to live together, let alone try to raise a family. Uh, that children require both male and female presence to have good male and female role modeling to them. And that in a homosexual family or a lesbian family, that is not available. Uh, but again, I don't know how, um, uh, what do you call that, uh, significant that is in Malaysia. All right. uh, that, uh, yeah, I'm reading another question. Can subgroups be formed to help support each other, especially in families? Oh, well, yeah, I think they can. You know, like you can have BEC family meetings and, you know, the children all kind of go together. You got a facilitator, give them activities and all that. Uh, you know, uh, that can, in, in church, sometimes you can have that also. So you, you can have other kinds of groups that can help to facilitate children's development. Now. Now I'm reading James Patrick. He says, our marriage, both of us are retirees. And in the second part of what I understand to be marriage at risk, of breaking again, what are your three best advices to stay married? <laughs> well, I think the first and most important thing is do not take your marriage for granted. Uh, spend time cultivating companionate love, you know. Uh, uh, <clears throat> spend time doing the little things. 
And when you do the little things like showing respect, showing compassion, listening to one another, you know, showing one another love languages. That's a very good book, huh? Daniel, uh, what's his name? Uh, Gary Chapman's The Five Love Languages. These are things you can do. Pay attention to the emotional bank, you know, that every day is opportunity for you to, 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 to show love, to show affection, whether it's from your words or from your deeds. Endeavor to show it concretely. And if you do that concretely, whether you feel it or not, you know, uh, well, that's another thing I'd say. Don't let your relationship be based on feeling. Because feelings are, like the Buddhists say, very impermanent. Mm. Okay? You get up, you know, you got a headache and you don't feel very lovey-dovey. Uh, you have problems in the work and you don't feel very lovey-dovey. Or whether or not you feel, you still have to show your commitment. You know, to be polite, to be respectful, to, uh, to, to take the trouble to listen, take the trouble to show empathy, and so forth. So if you have been doing that, then there's a good chance that when the emptiness happens, you will still be quite happy with one another. And another thing I guess that is important is make sure, as St. Paul says, you know, don't go to bed. I think it's St. Paul. Uh, with you know, with with a uh, with a grievance that is unresolved, make sure you you are able to sit down and talk to your wife or your husband about something you're unhappy about and work that through. And if you can't work that through because of too many other factors, psychological factors, make sure you get help to work that through. See uh, Father Peter Anthony or some some priest or some pastoral counselor or some psychologist to help you. Uh, we all come to our marriages with baggage, baggage that comes from our own family of origin, unresolved trauma, anger, uh, sexual abuse, uh, you know, um, uh, deep psychological scarring and woundedness. And if we are not aware of this, this can get into our relationships and this can actually damage the relationship quite substantially. So if you are finding that, oh, for the smallest reason, I seem to be getting angry. Or I'm very suspicious of my wife or very suspicious of my husband. Or I get anxious too easily. You know, I'm very distrustful. Where's that coming from? Okay, is this reasonable or is this excessive? Talk to it about with friends. Talk to it with a spiritual director, a counselor, a mentor. Because these unconscious factors that are individual to us come from our own family of origin if we are not mindful of it, can actually get into the marriage and destroy it. Which is why these days, even in the seminary, before a young person wants to become a priest, you got to go through a lot of psychological testing to see whether they are mentally sound, mentally stable, whether they got a lot of unresolved issues that can come into their life. And later on, as a parish priest, all these issues start coming out. Maybe we should have psychological tests for people who get married too. <laughs> I don't know, but whether or not you have a psychological testing, I think it's quite critical for us to realize that as individuals, we carry emotional baggage. And if we are not mindful of this emotional baggage, it's going to come into our lives, into our marriages, in our parenting, and screw things up big time. Okay, let me go to the next question. What about the family that views spirituality is not important within the family system? How can they integrate spiritual life into the family system? Now, that's a good question. Unfortunately, especially here in the West, but I think that also increasingly in, the, in, in third world countries like Malaysia, there are many people who have become disillusioned with religion. But I often... And sometimes, you know, like when I look at the Catholic Church, there's so much of the pedophilic scandals and so much of clericalism, which Pope Francis talks about, you know, clericalism as defined by the tendency of men and women of the cloth. I'm quite sure the two priests in our uh, chat today are exempt from that. Uh, to, be, to use their positions of religious authority more for their ego needs than for service of people and for the love of God. So it is possible that a person can be a priest and yet, you know, aspects of their ego are too strong, they're too controlling, they're too dominating, they're too 
insensitive, uh, self-centered, uh, scandalous sometimes, okay? As a result of that, there are a lot of people who become disillusioned with religion. What I would encourage them often, and I have a lot of clients like this who are disillusioned with religion, okay? I, I will tell them, you know, well, that might be the case, okay? But make sure you pay attention to your spiritual life because spirituality is much larger than religion. Religion often is belonging to an official religious institution. Spirituality is about your search for meaning. You're attempting to understand who am I? What is life all about? What is the purpose of my existence? Is there life after death? So if I am more than a body, then what am I? Do I have a soul? What is a soul? And if the soul continues after I die, then why did it come into this lifetime to grow, to evolve, to become more godlike? What happens when I live in accordance to this? And what happens if I live not in accordance to this? Or if I'm a non material entity that continues after I die, then I couldn't have been created through the transigencies of materialistic evolution. I must have been created by a supra-intelligent rationality, which many people call God or Allah or the Tao, or if you're more trendy, you might call it the force. Who is this God? Does this God have a particular personal interest in my life? How am I going to discern that interest? Now, this is the area of spirituality. Uh, so in the West, see a lot of people are more and more disillusioned with religion, but I think that they still can live a pretty decent spiritual life. And slowly when they become more and more spiritual, that might lead them back to going to church, to being more religious and so forth. I've seen that happen so many times in my work. Okay. Uh, the next question, how do we reach out emotionally to support elderly parents who are helpless, depressed, you know, overcoming the fact that their children are in a lay and uh, lesbian, gay and bisexual LGBT relationship. They have been deprived of their happiness and neglected by their children. Well, there's no easy answer to that, okay? Um, I think here, the first thing is to accept that if God loves my child, whether they are gay or not, then I have a duty to love them. So my ego aspirations of what I want my child to be might be shattered, okay? My child is not living up to my dreams and what I think might have been bringing shame to the family. But I need to learn to take the mind of God to love them no matter what they are. Now, this is not easy, but I think that this is the first step. Sometimes we can become very ego attached. We have all these expectations, all these, you know, uh, demands that we have of our children. And when they don't live to those expectations to hell with you, you know, that's kind of like conditional love, isn't it? And yet the gospel imperative is that we actually become like God. Jesus said, be ye. Perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. An invitation to us to become like God in the way we unconditionally accept everyone, including our children who are gay. And this might not be consistent with our own ethical ideas, but God does not reject us because we turn away from him or her, but continues to reach out, continues to show compassion, continues to invite them. So I suppose one of the first things we can do is to help the parent who is elderly recognize that perhaps your son being gay is not just his problem. It is also your problem. You are being invited to a higher level of consciousness. And if you can do that, to, and the higher level of consciousness is to understand a much deeper level of love and acceptance. And once you can do that, lots of things start changing. Well, that's my short answer to this very complex question, okay? So the next question by Philo. People are losing interpersonal skills rather 
they text or chat in social media. This is a huge paradigm shift. You're absolutely correct about that. Bite-sized information is all a lot of young people can manage. They have no more, uh, they have very reduced capacity to have interactive conversation with others, you know? Uh, and that's something to help them to become aware of. You know, there's a book by um, uh, Teen Brain by, I don't know, I can't remember what's his name, Daniel. I don't know his name. Was it? I, I can't remember his name, but the name of the book is Teen Brain. Well, right? It's about. I don't know well, uh, Maria, I think you are on. I can, ah, yes. Uh, you know, uh, where he talks about internet addiction and how to help young people to overcome internet addiction. And uh, that's, that's a topic for a whole session. Uh, uh, but I, I can just point you to, to, to that book, uh, um, The Teen Brain, uh, about how to manage internet addiction, computer and gaming addiction. Okay. Okay. Uh, CFSM Singapore forms groups to help families to live out of faith. Okay, that's not a question. Yeah, I hope I've answered all the questions here. Any other questions? Oh, we have only about three minutes. Maybe we may not have time for that. So, uh, so thank you very much. Uh, and I see some questions uh, with regards to marriage getting into a little bit of a challenge. Uh, we just like to you know inform everyone that the Archdiocese Family Life Commission organizes this program called Retroval. And if you, I put the email address there in the chat box, any one of you would like to know more about Retroval. And if you wish to enroll into a program such as Retroval, please uh, send an email to Basil and Martina. And we are happy to, to reach out to you and uh, let you know more about Retroval, yeah? So um, if there's no other last questions, uh, you know, time is up. I just like to introduce uh, very quickly, Robert and Sheila, our chair couple for the Archdiocese Family Life Commission. Um, and also within this group, we have got uh, Basil and Martina, uh, Andrew and Angeline, Joe and Anita. Andrew, Andrew, Sorry, Fred, <laughs> Francis and Angeline, uh, who runs the Retroval program uh, together. Uh, Francis, uh, Andrew and Andrin uh, heads the Catholic yes. marriage preparation course. So all very powerful people in this group, actually. So if you want to reach out to any one of us on any of these things that we just mentioned, um, AFLC organizes um, programs uh, like um, Retroval, CMPC, Marriage, marriage Encounter, yes. Uh, and also at some other formations like uh, Five Shades of Love, or I think Joe and Anita. Five, five languages. languages of love, sorry, sorry, not Five Shades of Love, Five Languages. Uh, five Shades <laughs> of Love is a different book, sorry. Um, and, uh, and other programs as well. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, and uh, if you can oblige us to take a group photograph, we can switch on all your cameras before I invite Father Andrew uh, to say the closing prayer, can you switch on all your uh, cameras and I'll take a quick photo. Yeah, okay. Two more seconds for you all to switch on your cameras. One, two, three, just one minute. I need to get the other screen as well. So that everyone is caught. Okay, screen number two, one, two. Okay, thank you very much. But Andrew, do you mind giving us the, sorry, uh, Gerard, you want to say any last um, advice or points to us? Uh, no, not really. I just want to thank you all for being such good listeners and uh, asking such lovely questions. And I wish you all well. It's as I said, it's easy to fall in love. It's hard to remain in love. And that's actually a book by Aaron Beck, I think. So I want to wish you all every success in your marriage and your family life. God bless you all. Thank you. And on behalf of all of us here, we thank you, Gerard, for your time. Well, Marriage is words, uh, words. 
Sorry. Ah, yeah. I uh, would like to thank uh, Gerard Ko uh, to take your time in your busy schedule to be with us. You are one of the ex experts in the family uh, therapist, and also we hear a lot of uh, from our community here in Malaysia that you are running a lot of programs for our seminarians, also for the seminaries uh, that you are giving some advice and counselling. And also, I think uh, this is a good thing that you know you said in the beginning. You know, is we are making injustice. You know, to this topic of a healthy family life system. Uh, yeah, it's one hour. It cannot cater to all the important things that you have brought out. You know, the subsystem and all these things. This is a new thing for for me uh, to be in this uh, area. Uh, can you suggest one or two books that it will be helpful for all of us uh, who are family parents? Uh, to read, you know, uh, to get into, to be, venture into the subsystems of how this can be helpful for our family, uh, healthy family life. Maybe one or two books. One uh, or two books. Oh, well, if you want a real good academic book by a Christian psychologist, a family therapist, James Dobson, you know, I just Googled the name James Dobson. I think uh, he's got a lot of books and he's the guru of family therapy. Uh, but I don't think that that's something for the ordinary person. It's more for academics. Um, uh, but you can get a lot of good stuff, you know. You don't really have to even get books these days, you know. You just Google how to build intimacy, you know, in, in my marriage system. You know, how to be a, a better parenting skills. Uh, how to manage, um, you know, <clears throat> difficult children. Uh, if my child has got ADHD, how to parent him in the best way possible. Uh, how to manage uh, mental illness in the family subsystem, uh, family system. You'd be surprised. There are literally thousands of articles that are there. And of course, choose uh, good ones. Huh? So, so you don't even have to get books anymore these days, I'd say. The yeah. internet is a fantastic source. But of course, use your mind and your intuition and good sense. And, uh, and some of this can be very secular. So inform this with your own gospel value lives. And, and you, 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 there's an ocean of knowledge out there. In fact, all my information that I got for you today is from the internet. You know, nobody gets anything from books anymore. Although if, you, if, you, if you're going to be an expert, it'll be good to read books, you know. Uh, Five Languages of Love is a good one for intimacy. Uh, another one by Aaron Beck, uh, Falling in Love is Not Enough, you know. That's another one also. It's an old book uh, where he says, you know, and he, he refers more to passionate love. He says a lot of people fall in love and they think that that'll last forever. He says, no, love is not enough. You need to have skills. You need to have maturity. You need to have mindfulness. You need to have good values, good attitudes, or your love can diminish very fast. <laughs> you know, when two people are there at the altar at the wedding, you're like thinking, oh my gosh, I hope they live happily ever after. In my experience, you know, the very next day, sometimes they could hit reality. Oh my gosh, this is not the man I thought I married. Or this is not the woman I thought, you know, I married. I was just idealizing her. And now I'm faced with a reality. How am I going to live for the next 40 years with him or her? So there you go now. Uh, uh, but there are, there are many, many good books. Um, uh, the Dance of Intimacy uh, by Maggie Schaff is another good one that I did while I read while I did my master's in pastoral counseling in Chicago, Loyola, Chicago, many years ago. Um, but again, just check the internet, you know, books on marriage. You have a lot more recent books too. And just look at them, you know, you, you, you can get them on Kindle immediately almost you don't even have to wait a lot of my books these days i get back from Google and it's about one the price so you just put it on your computer put it on your mobile phone and you can read it wherever you are good family uh, therapy books or you know books on, on marriage books on um family life and so forth uh, so the internet is your resource god is using the internet to reach us but so is the devil. <laughs> yeah, I hope yeah. that answers your question, the father. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, no, another thing that you, in the beginning you said, you know, you're caught with COVID. Huh? So yes. with your uh, health um, not issues, that your health issues, still you're with us. We will pray for your speedy recovery. And thank you so much for being with us this morning. Yeah. 
I'm very surprised I didn't cough, Father. It must be your prayers. Because, you know, in the last two days, whenever I'm doing counseling, you know, if I talk too much, I, I, I actually start coughing. And today I thought, oh my gosh, I'm probably going to cough a lot. But maybe your prayers did work, the, do the trick. And I didn't cough at all during the whole session. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. That's all. Thank, thanks, Gerard. Thank, Thank you, you Father Peter and uh, Father Andrew. Can you, uh, you want to say a few words? And yeah, uh, I, I think maybe uh, to help some of us, uh, especially as you have said, the number of uh, material on the internet is very vast. Uh, um, perhaps you might know a few sites which are a bit more reliable or something like that, which we can refer to. Because, you know, if we start looking at all the different sites uh, and if you are not well versed or familiar with what to look for, then, we might, then some might even go into sites which are not so uh, suitable or something like that. You know? So I'm just wondering maybe if you have a few sites uh, which may be of help to many of us, uh, then that <clears throat> could be a good starting point, Gerard. Yes. Uh, well, I... Um, uh, John Bradshaw Healing Within the Family, that's also very good. Taking Your Family Back by Jefferson for Jefferson Beth. Mm -hmm. Love and Respect in the Family by Dr. Emerson. I, I'm looking at the internet right now. Okay. You know, and uh, so, uh, you know, you, you look at a book and the title, you more or less will be able to, you know, get themes that are, you know, consistent with, uh, with Christian principles. How to Have a Happy Family Life. Okay. Learn the Secrets of Happy Family Life. Mm -hmm. Family Life by Akril Sharma, um, The Secrets of Happy Family Life by Bruce Feiler, Making Your Family Happy. Uh, yeah, you just check that out, look at the reviews, and then, uh, you know, uh, that can give you a lot of information. But I think use our discerning mind and pray. The best thing is, you know, before you do it, you always ask for guidance from the Holy Spirit, you know, that whatever. You, you read that the Holy Spirit will inspire you. You might see 20 books and suddenly one book will jump out at you. And uh, you pray about it, you look at the reviews and then you make a decision to buy that book on Kindle. One or some. Yeah. I don't know if that helps, Father. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, so again, uh, well, perhaps before Father say the closing prayer, Father Andrew, and the final blessing, maybe uh, Robert and Sheila, you want to say anything? Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much. I think we have total all together about 30, uh, 36 came in. All right, now we have 30. Um, uh, thank you, Deva and Jackie, for organizing it. Um, Gerard, thank you so much. A very short brief, but would like to engage you, you know, moving forward. A lot of things have been picked up. And um, of course, family life has been a, is a heavyweight ministry in our archdiocese. All right, it's not easy to manage, but we are kind of a supporting with all the programs that we have uh, to support the family, especially those broken families, uh, Single mothers basically have been singled out, divorcees, all these areas are concerned that we need to look into it. Uh, we've been having activities for the families, but uh, we have, uh, our areas of focus has to be on the, um, the single mothers, the divorcees, the broken marriages, the migrants. Uh, these are things that we need to look at that area. Yeah, and, and of course, we personally need to build up our family life. And that's where we can practice and share to others. Yeah, uh, maybe, uh, okay. Shila, you wanna say something? <laughs> okay, all right, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Robert. Father Andrew, back to you. So we will, uh, in the name of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this uh, session, no matter how brief it may have been. We also ask you Lord, to continue to help us so that we will uh, grow together as we learn more towards uh, more regarding our families and help us also a lot to continue to trust in you as we continue with this uh, endemic. We also ask you a lot to 
take care of our brother, our uh, Gerard, that he will be healthy and safe, even though he has uh, uh, this uh, COVID-19. And we ask you Lord to continue to guide each and every one of us so that we too will be protected and safe as we continue to do your will. We make this prayer to Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord be with you. And with your spirit. spirit. Almighty God bless you, all, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Thank you. So thank you and enjoy your weekend, everyone. Thank you, Joran. Okay. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, Joran. Thank you. Bye. 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 B